Lou Katzos, the president of the East Mediterranean Business and Culture Alliance. Uh, tonight we have our second annual Hellenic Shipping uh, panel discussion event. We have a spectacular panel. In addition to discussing the, fill, the uh, shipping industry, this, uh, this year we will also announce a, a committee that will uh, relate to what we uh, discussed last year, which is to put together a committee, a friendship committee, that will uh, basically find a location in New York to build a monument to uh, the merchant marines that lost their lives during World War II, the fleets uh, also associated with that, and on the other hand, a gratitude and a thank you to the United States for supplying the Blessed Liberty ships. Είναι μια προσπάθεια που οφείλεται εν πολύ ίσω αποκλειστικά στον κύριο Κάτσο, που αποτελεί συνέχεια του περσινού, ε, της περσινής εκδήλωσης που είχε γίνει πάλι εδώ στον ίδιο χώρο, σχετικά με την ελληνική ναυτιλία. Γνωρίζετε πάρα πολύ καλά ότι η ελληνική ναυτιλία αποτελεί μια μεγάλη δύναμη, ε, παγκόσμια δύναμη για την Ελλάδα. Είμαστε πολύ περήφανοι γι' αυτό και νομίζω ότι αξίζουν θερμά συγχαρητήρια στον κύριο Κάτσο που ο, ο οποίος με την εκδήλωση αυτή στοχεύει τόσο στο μέλλον της ελληνικής ναυτιλίας αλλά όσο και στην ανάπτυξη του παρελθόντος και αυτό είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό. Παύλος Κοτρότσιος, publisher του Hellenic News of America και founder του Hermes Expo International. Χαίρομαι που είμαι σήμερα εδώ στο Eastern Mediterranean Business and Cultural Alliance να υποστηρίζουν και να στηρίζουν μια τέτοια ε, διοργάνωση για το shipping και να έχουν τόσο πολύ καλούς ομιλητές. Βλέπω την αίθουσα είναι κατάμεστη. Ο κύριος Λουκάτσος κάνει μια πάρα πολύ καλή δουλειά και σαν πρόεδρος και σαν founder μαζί με τους συνεργάτες του και ο Κώστας ο Δρούγος επίσης βοηθάει απόψε την, την εκδήλωση αυτή. So, ε, πρέπει να γίνονται πάρα πολλά τέτοια ε, γεγονότα και ιδιαίτερα στο Μανχάταν που είναι μια multicultural ε, ε, κοινότητα έτσι και είναι μια οικονομική δύναμη σε ένα παγκόσμιο επίπεδο. Εμείς χαιρόμαστε που βρισκόμαστε εδώ και σαν Ερμής και σαν Hellenic News of America. Γεια σας, Μπιλ Ματσικούδης, δικηγόρος στη Νέα Γερσέη και πρωί υποψήφιος για δήμαρχος στο Jersey City. Χαίρομαι που είμαι εδώ σήμερα με το EMBCA. Είναι πάρα πολύ καλή ευκαιρία να μάθουμε κάτι για την αγορά στο, στην Ανατολική Μεσάγειο. Και πάντοτε είναι πάρα πολύ καλή ευκαιρία να κάνουμε καινούριες νοριμίες και επαφές. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. For us, this is a wonderful occasion. Uh, this is the second annual Hellenic um, uh, uh, shipping uh, panel discussion. We started it uh, last year, actually, when we announced uh, that what we wanted to do, and let me give you a little bit of background about this because it's kind of important. When I was, uh, when I was with the Hellenic London Chamber of Commerce as their executive vice president, uh, Samatis Gikas, who at the time was the uh, executive director, uh, showed me some uh, some literature that was written by by someone in Greece actually who has uh, an internet almost uh, maritime museum uh, a fellow by the name of Pustanas. As a matter of fact, uh, he would have been also here tonight uh, from Athens, but he had certain uh, certain complications. What what Samat gave me was some literature that related to uh, events that took place uh, during the war, during the Second World War. And it had to do with the uh, merchant marines, and it had to do with uh, with liberty ships. And one of the things that uh, Stamati mentioned is he said, "Lou, take a look at this. Uh, there's no monument uh, to these people who sacrificed a lot uh, during uh, the Second World War." And when I got into the literature, and again, it was brief at that time. Now I think Stamati has written a few books, but at the time that uh, with the material that I read. Uh, there was an indication that about 2,500 uh, merchant marines lost their lives in the war, and it had to do with the fact that they were transporting supplies uh, to the Allied forces uh, in, in particular. Uh, many people uh, don't realize, but um, even, even in, at that particular time before the war, you can see it in one of the books that I have outside, which lists uh, all the different merchant marine nations and lists all the ships, uh, nation by nation, uh, in terms of their, their name, uh, who, owned, who owned a particular ship, uh, the size of the ship, the engines, and things of that nature. And also, at the end of the book, you'll see something that's fascinating, which is uh, all the ships that were uh, destroyed during the war and, and targeted. When nation after nation fell uh, in, uh, 
with the act from the Axis powers in six weeks, more stuff more than Europe was obviously uh, taken over. But uh, England was uh, in the war. At the time, the U.S. had not entered the war. And a lot of the ships that were, in fact, uh, supplying uh, the very few people that were left that were not taken over were, in fact, uh, Hellenic ships. And those Hellenic ships, again, uh, related to the 2,500 uh, merchant marines uh, that we're talking about. But also the fleet, the fleet had uh, uh, three quarters of it was destroyed. At the time of uh, prior to World War II, um, and of course Greece got into the war in uh, October 28, uh, 1940, and last month we celebrated what they call Archie Day. Uh, two thirds uh, or three quarters of the fleet were, were, was destroyed. And it was, it was that, that circumstance that was taking place, that was known at the time. This is the thing. Years passed, decades passed, and we forget the sacrifices. But at the time that these things happened, it was in the papers on a constant basis. And at that time, after the war, when, when the US had uh, all these surplus liberty ships, they in particular were very interested in uh, supplying to the Hellenic uh, ship owners in particular uh, Liberty ships. Uh, at the time, uh, according to some people, one of them is in the audience right now, uh, the ships were going for about 600000 per ship, uh, but to the Greek uh, ship owners, they were actually offering them for 200000 And that was in recognition of, uh, of the sacrifices that took, uh, that took place uh, during that time period. And one of the things that struck me uh, and in particular, what Stamati had said is, there is no memorial to those that lost their lives, to the ships that were lost, and also a memorial that's in gratitude to the United States for supplying the Liberty ships, which became the basis of the modern Hellenic fleet, which is now the largest in the world. Uh, it, uh, basically, by uh, it's like 23% of, uh, of the whole international fleet. Uh, certainly by, by different measures. And again, uh, the Hellenic fleet is not only, uh, when we say Hellenic fleet, we're talking about Hellenic owned fleet because uh, uh, Hellenic owned ships uh, are flying 40 different flags. A lot of them are in Greece, obviously, some of them are in Cyprus, but certainly a lot of flags in the world. So there's two, there's two different components, and uh, last year we introduced a concept of creating a monument. We just chatted about it because it was in, in our minds, in my mind and Emka's mind. We brought it up at one of the uh, panel discussions that we, uh, that we had. It had nothing to do with shipping. And that was the genesis, actually, last year of the first uh, shipping panel discussion. Because we realized that a lot of people don't really know anything about this industry, even though, even Hellenes, by the way. And when you think about the, uh, the Hellenic people, for example, uh, shipping was a part of their history for thousands of years. It was those ships in the, in, in the, uh, in the period that went throughout the, the Mediterranean, not only the Eastern Mediterranean, but also the Western Mediterranean. It was those ships that founded uh, 600 uh, colonies throughout the Mediterranean. It was those ships that, for example, that were sailing out of Marseille, and you had uh, Phidias at that time, you know, with, uh, before the, the uh, modern era, that was sailing ships into what is now Iceland, uh, sailing ships into Scotland, into Ireland. And it was those ships that uh, during the Mycenaean period and during, the, uh, during the, uh, also the, uh, the Cretan period, that in fact in the Bronze Age were shipping things back and forth. It's the reason why, for example, uh, Cyprus got the name that it has, that had to do with the shipping of uh, copper and all the rest of that in, in the world. And also, while we're talking about the Hellenic uh, people, the Hellenic nation, shipping was the, was the, again, the occupation that created the United States of America. When we talk about the US, when we talk about the major cities of the, Europe, of the US, when we talk about New York, shipping, trading, was, was a big deal. Boston, Charleston, New Orleans. And uh, also when we talk about immigration, for example, we talk about Hellenic Americans, we talk about immigrants and all the rest of that, 
Again, many people don't, don't realize that the first, the first people that came here from the Hellenic Republic were actually merchants that came here prior to the Civil War. That's the reason why, for example, the first uh, you know, Hellenic Orthodox Church was in, was in New Orleans. And that's the reason why you had people in that period having established offices in New York, in uh, Charleston, in uh, London, in uh, Cairo, in Egypt, and, that, and obviously in Asia Minor, which uh, became problematic after the, after the So we thought of this concept as being a Hellenic shipping con uh, concept, but also a gratitude to the United States. When we talk about, about our relationship, our relationship is obviously not meaning the Hellenic Republic and, uh, and America. The relationship goes way back, including in the shipping industry. And even in the merchant marines, when we talk about the US merchant marines, okay, they also have not been properly memorialized. Okay, that's another thing to keep in mind when we're, when we're having the discussion. But when we talk about things in, in US history, for example, we talk about, uh, uh, let's say the Marine Corps, we talk about the, you know, the, shores, the shores of Tripoli. Who was in Tripoli? Okay, the Marine Corps you know, uh, song that they have, you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Who was fighting in Tripoli? Many people don't realize that, in fact, Certainly it was the Marines, there was, a few, there was a definitely a core of Marines, but also people don't realize that there were 500 mercenaries that fought with the Marines. The Marines were basically, I'm not sure, there were maybe about 30, you guys would know better, because you're in the classes, but uh, I think there were about 30, but there was, there was a, a much larger contingent of mercenaries that were actually Hellenic mercenaries. And the first, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, Barbary War, that took place in 1801 to 1805 was in fact fought together again, U.S. and Hellenic and Hellenic uh, mercenaries in this particular case in one of the most major battles that ended the, uh, the Barbary Wars. What am I really getting at? What I'm getting at is this: uh, we have a lot of negativity taking place in the news media, in particular about the Hellenic Republic, all types of propaganda that's taking place about. Uh, creating the other, creating the other within Europe and all the rest of that. But one of the things that no one can touch is the shipping industry, which is the number one uh, uh, shipping uh, powerhouse, let's say, in the world. And that powerhouse, again, was, uh, was reconstituted and helped by the United States of America in gratitude for what took place. It's only proper that uh, we brought it up last year. It's only proper that this year we're, we're going to announce actually, and we're announcing tonight formally, that a committee is being set up to, uh, and we're calling it temporarily, we're calling it the Hellenic Shipping and Friendship uh, Memorial Committee. And uh, to a certain degree, it also relates, I think, with, uh, with Senator Artakis, uh, 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 your, your uh, event, uh, let's say, in February in Greece itself, and you can talk about it further, which had again to do with the, with the friendship between the United States uh, and uh, the Hellenic Republic. The site, uh, where, where would we like to place the monument? We'd like to place the monument in Lower Manhattan, which is where, where we believe it's appropriate to be placed. And the reason why is because, again, many people don't realize that a lot of the major shipping companies, Hellenic shipping companies, were actually based in Lower Manhattan itself. And as a matter of fact, when the, when the war broke out and a lot of ships were on the sea, many of the uh, Hellenic fleet ships actually came into the United States and many of those merchant marines actually stayed in the U.S. Many of them joined the military, the U.S. military. Some of them after the war stayed in the U.S., some of them went back. And there were many people, obviously, including uh, Papadreva, actually, who, uh, who was uh, enlisted in the U.S. Navy and, and was actually uh, a member of the uh, U.S. Armed Forces during, uh, during World War II. So it's only fitting that, uh, and tonight is about um, really two things. One is to continue, and we're gonna do this on a yearly basis, to continue the, the, uh, the panel discussion relating to the shipping industry itself, which is an important industry. Everything that's around us, everything that you're wearing, 
the chairs, everything that, because uh, I'm in the construction in industry, just about everything that we import into the United States is on those ships. And again, uh, it's not only uh, Hellenic ships, but Hellenic ships are bringing in oil, Hellenic ships are bringing all types of things that will be better discussed by the panel, uh, you know, who's into that. So I did, I did in fact, uh, bring up this issue before the election. You know, I stopped during the election to, uh, uh, to the mayor of New York City. I told him that we did, uh, to de Blasio, I did say that we wanted something uh, in lower Manhattan relating to, uh, to this particular uh, memorial. But it's something that, uh, again, when you're in the construction industry, it's about logistics, it's about money, it's about materials, it's about the politics. So we're realists. We know, we know in fact, we're not, we don't imagine things. We know what we have to do because we know how to build buildings, and we certainly know how to build a monument, and we certainly know how to acquire uh, land in order to put the monument on. So we've set a, a temporary target in our minds of about, of about three years that we think it will take between doing the politics and, and also raising awareness in terms of this particular mo monument. How are we going to raise awareness? One of the things we're going to do is, is uh, bring in uh, other aspects, the soft aspects of culture. And they have to do, for example, with art and artists. So we do intend to have a contest that, that will start to uh, promote artists putting together schemes. And we'll do a prize, by the way. We'll have a monetary prize to that. Uh, for them to develop different schemes so we can have something to show. It creates. It creates the vision of it. It creates, again, something that we could maybe go to the uh, Hellenic Consulate and have actually an exhibition on all those things. And maybe we create a committee that, uh, that awards the, the prize. Uh, we do want to, uh, to do a documentary on all the type of things that we were talking about in a lot more detail than I'm discussing tonight, because we think it's important visually to show people things, while, in fact, we're working on the politics uh, the, the important politics, obviously, of getting the land. In terms of raising the money, there are people that right now want to give money, actually, to the monument, but we're not, we're not asking for money right now. And, and we believe that, that uh, I hate to say this, because I say certain things, and, but we do do them. I think that's the easiest part of everything. The biggest part is to raise, uh, raise the awareness and also to get the location, and then we will raise the money. We also have the Council General of the Hellenic Republic here in the audience. This Council General say a couple of words. One thing that uh, I admire with Lou is uh, not only the, the history knowledge, the deep history knowledge that he has, and I always enjoy what he's, uh, he's saying, what, what a great amount of things that we have learned during this last moment. But one thing I admire with him is that he has a vision. He has a vision and he has a, a passion to do that. And uh, Lou, please accept, accept my congratulations, the congratulations of the Hellenic Republic for all the initiatives that you, initiatives that you have taken. And please, please continue to do so. Please continue to do so. The Consulate General of Greece in Europe is here, is by your side, and we would be more than happy to host an exhibition or any kind of event in our premises uh, there, because there it is your house. Thank you very much. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the uh, the moderator. We have a spectacular we have a spectacular panel that, that has been assembled to discuss the two issues that we talked about: one about the industry, the other one about the monument. And I'll introduce Dr. Smithis, uh, who will take over from there and introduce the, the event. Thank you. Again, and thanks again for every, everybody for joining us today. We have a spectacular panel, as uh, Lou mentioned. And let me, without further ado, introduce them to you. Uh, to my right is Senator Leonidas Raptakis, which represents the 33 district in Rhode Island. He's vice chairman of the Senate Committee on Special Legislation and Veteran Affairs, member of the Senate Committee on Judiciary. He's been a member of, Earth of the Rhode Island Legislation Legislature almost continuously since 1996, married to Donna Maria Gidio, has two children. A restaurant owner and operator, Senator Artakis earned a BA in 1985 from Rhode Island College and an AA in 1981 from Community College of Rhode Island. He's also a graduate of Coventry High School. Senator Artakis is also a member of Alpha Omega of Akepa District, Chapter 106, District 7, the Annunciation Church 
of, uh, of, your, of your area, Club 100, and the, the Elks of Coventry and the West Greenwich, and the uh, FOP Laws number 26. Constantin Drugos is the Managing Director of Argo Marketing International, a shipping and physical commodities trading consultant specializing in minerals and fertilizers. He's also the President and Member of the Board of, of Zero Net Carbon Risk that represents Virginia Carbonite Corporation, a clean coal to energy and liquids technology, and a senior associate and advisory board member of the Steel Business Group, member of the board of Eastern Mediterranean Business and Culture Association and a CAPA subject 25, holds an MPA from Indiana State University, and he lives with us in New York and spends his time between New York and Athens. Mr. Andreas Theoharis, happy name the Andreas today, is the Vice President and Chartering Director of Southern Star Shipping in Atlantic Bulk Carriers Management Limited, a long established dry and wet tonnage ship owner and operator, engaged in ship management, contracts of agreement, vessel charter, logistics, and joint ventures. A very appropriate member to have in our panel today. Andreas was previously the Managing Director of Kroon Shipping of New York an active established independent ship operator, and also before that, president and chief operating officer of Lasco Shipping in Portland, Oregon. He holds two Master of Science degrees in Economics and Transportation. Finally, Dr. Kirsi Tika is Executive Vice President, Global Marine at the American Bureau of Shipping, responsible for aligning ABS strategic planning, client development, and product and services service offerings with the industry technical needs, and requirements. Previously, Dr. Tika served as ABS's Europe Division President and Vice President and Chief Engineer there as well. Before joining ABS in 2001, Dr. Tika was a professor of naval architecture at the Webb Institute in New York. In addition to teaching, she carried out research on structural strength of tankers and risk analysis. And she, is act and she was actively involved in the U.S. National Research Council on Marine Board, Marine Board Studies on Double Hull Tankers. Without further ado, then, let's start on the discussion of the panel of today. Greek shipping is an industry that Greece is very proud of. It's an industry that uh, when you are Greek, people come to you and ask your advice, try to associate with you. Greeks own more than 5,000 ships, which are worth today more than $100 billion. That is about 30%, 35% of the national debt of Greece. We own, Greeks own, about 15% of all, uh, of all the vessels that float, 20% of bulkers, and 23% of tankers. So we are a big, a big factor in that industry. With that background, let me turn to our panel and carry, pick it up where Lou left it and uh, ask Constantine to give us some more information about the monument, Greece contributions during the, the, the Second World War, and all this history that brought us here today. So when we start talking uh, with Lou about uh, Greek shipping, it was, uh, you know, was involved uh, in some projects and was it was very interesting. I started digging into it, and uh, there is uh, way too many histories actually to cover today. And, uh, but what is really the story is that this is an industry that touches millions of people every year. There are millions of people have been employed by those five ships, either on the ships or at the ports. Uh, and uh, and uh, as we talked about with uh, uh, Tasso yesterday. Uh, some of the biggest companies, like for example, Hyundai became Hyundai, what we know today, because of big order of ships that they got from a, a Greek ship owner. And uh, actually, when I met with Mr. Kostanos in Athens, and uh, you should check uh, uh, the Greek Shipping Miracle, this is the only uh, museum, shipping museum on, online, actually. And there's some great stories. Uh, there was a, a brochure from Bethlehem Steel that the Libanos. Uh, or the tanker after World War II. And it would say that, uh, you know, thank Mr. Levan gave jobs to a thousand people for a year. And, uh, 
So it has an impact on global scale. Then, today, and it's actually, uh, we talk about risk, we think about the past a lot of times. So this is an industry that has a past, a present, and a future. And it's very important uh, when we talked about you know, the conversation that is happening today about risk and uh, what's happening to have other conversations, not forget what's happening, what, ha what happened and what's happening, you know, some of the other things that are actually worth talking about. And, and definitely Greek shipping is uh, one of them. And there is uh, there's, uh, quite a few characters which I'm sure you all recognize, uh, like Onassis, it's a name that is a household name around the world. And it's uh, created, you know, had a lot of stories that go along with it, but it started all with shipping and trading. And uh, from what I understood after actually researching, uh, uh, this uh, more I got more and more deep into it. I think in English we say that the Greeks get you know, that sugar, and we're gonna get more into it later when uh, the other panelists <laughs> are here and more into it. But uh, that's how we started this conversation, and we're gonna have a monument, to a documentary. We're planning to put uh, some of the stories uh, on the screen. Um, Lou is talking to somebody about writing a book. And uh, and there are many other ideas, and of course this is the beginning. So we're welcoming any other ideas that we'll, that people have here. Thank you. The central part of this uh, story is the Liberty ships that were built during the World War. They were appropriately named. They were constructed here in the states. In fact, there is uh, the anecdote, not anecdote, the <coughs> build them quickly. The U.S. implemented uh, a new technology, welding, to build the ships. Up to then, ships were built, were riveted. And uh, there was a big discussion and uh, fear that the welded ship would not be as seaworthy as the riveted ships, but it turned out to be very seaworthy and uh, uh, helped the Allies carry, carry the war. And at the end, as, as Lou mentioned, at the end of the war, uh, the United States facilitated transfer of that uh, fleet uh, to, to, to its Allies, Greeks among them. And I know. Uh, Senator or Leonidas, should we go with first names to make it simple, Leonidas? Um, you were involved in, uh, in, the, in the last Liberty City. Yes. Can you tell us about it? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor, and Lou, thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, also to the uh, young men from the. Uh, Thanks, boy, for across the bay. Right across the bay. But, uh, anyhow, uh, there's a long history, ladies and gentlemen, between. Uh, the United States and also going back to the Virgin Marine. As Lou had stated, my dad served in the Greek Navy from 1937 to 1939 and embarked in 1939 late on the Nair He served on the Nair first Greek passenger to transatlantic uh, from New York to Paris service the Greek line from Agros. And on a voyage around October 28, 1940, the ship was heading westward toward New York at just uh, left Gibraltar, and that's when Italy invaded Greece on October 20, 1940. The ship arrived in New York on November 8th, and the whole crew disembarked. And that was, my father also disembarked. And that ship survived the war. The English had taken it over, became the Nelly Wallace. But my father disembarked, he came down the gangplank with his cousin, and then the US government said, welcome to the US, welcome to the US Army. So he served from the Navy, Greek merchant uh, marine, to the U.S. Army, and learning from my dad how important, he told me a lot of stories about uh, our family, uh, many uh, relatives uh, from Andrus, and my uncle died during World War II, uh, during the war, and uh, it's important because all this history has to tie in. We talk about the history of the Liberty Ship, how important it was, and I see Jim Tampakis in the audience. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, there was 2,300 Liberty Ships built during World War II. Only three are left today. The Jeremiah O'Brien in San Francisco, the John Brown in uh, Baltimore, and one last Liberty ship, the Arthur Huddle, that was sitting in the James River for over 20 years after serving with ITT laying transatlantic cables. So I mentioned Jim because in 2005, the Greek government, through Minister Kepaloyanis, asked our US Ambassador, Ambassador Reese, can you get me a, a, what is the last Liberty ship? Is there one left in the US fleet or on the James River in the Norfolk fleet? And we did find one, but it took so many years, first of all,
getting the U.S. Congress to pass under the James uh, Warner Act to transfer, first of all, the U.S. property possession to the to the Greek uh, country to, to Greece. The problem we had was where we can get the money. Uh, Jim Tepakis and his firm, under Spiro Polemis Romandros and uh, the late Kostanopoulos, uh, saw a vision with many ship owners. And that vision, during 2007 in Athens, under U.S. Ambassador Speckhardt, we did a PowerPoint presentation, and within 20 minutes, we raised over $10 million with uh, Mr. Kostanopoulos putting the, the, birth, the most of the money uh, for making this project a go. But Jim's company and uh, Petros Louboudis from Belmont from New Jersey were the managers of getting that ship out of a Norfolk state on the James River, towing it to Norfolk, taking six months to prepare it. And that ship, ladies and gentlemen, sailed to Greece, towed, I should say, on December 6th, St. Nicholas Day. So it was almost nine years ago that the delivery ship, the Arthur Harlow, was towed back to Greece, took 43 days. When the ship arrived in January, uh, I remember uh, Captain Kostantopoulos uh, was so ecstatic. He served on the liveries, but it was his almost like a child coming home. But he was the uh, leader. It took nine months to refurbish that ship. That ship, the uh, last livery, is probably in better condition than the uh, <coughs> Jeremiah O'Brien and the Arthur Huddle, who probably took so many of the parts of that ship. And, but putting that history together in Piraeus is very important because we honor the 2,000 merchant mariners of Greek descent that died. We also honor the Greek shipping industry that over two-thirds of the ships were either torpedoed or lost during World War II. But the key issue is how do we build a bridge between the past, the present, like you said, and the future? A lot of Greek youth right now in Greece are struggling to have jobs. But during the uh, event on the uh, La Celebrity in February of 2017, we honored the Truman Doctrine, which President Harry Truman helped Greece with over $400 million in aid, and we emphasized how do we bring this together. But it's also a part of the Greek government that should also help Greek companies, Greek shipping companies, hire the new generation. We're not talking about captains, uh, cooks. We're talking about the Greek youth. I think the unemployment is about 50%. To look at working in Greek shipping companies as lawyers, accountants, financiers. But again, a lot of work still has to be done so we can bridge that gap where Greek companies can hire either as interns those youngsters that can either work in Piraeus, London, even here in New York. And I remember during that uh, event, uh, there was one young lady, Irene Nokias, who has Project Connect, which is trying to build that bridge. And also having that discussion with the new minister, Minister Kouriblis, is very enthusiastic. And that's how we connect past history, how important the delivery ship is, with also a monument. So we remember, we remember the past. Also, what's important, ladies and gentlemen, something very special I want to say tonight is that uh, after 10 years of working very hard, finally, uh, this week, a memorandum of understanding was signed, or it's going to be signed, by Sunny Maritime. Sorry about that, guys. Well, you know, competitors from across the Bay. The State University of New York that is playing a key role, and also your university, also King's Point. And I'll tell you why. Greece. Uh, worked about seven years to get this agreement uh, to Sunny Maritime, which we're gonna have a partnership between the university and the Greek Naval Academy of Idra, Turkey, Panama, Taiwan, the Philippines, South Korea, have signed these agreements. Why is it very important to have these agreements? Because when you have a Greek student from the Maritime Academy in Greece attend Sunny Maritime in have a Sunny Maritime cadet attend a Greek uh, Richard Green Academy, well, whether it's for several months or maybe even up to a year, you start bonding having a very close relationship. And that also spills also having a very close relationship between the United States and Greece, as we've seen today, the closest relationships we've ever had historically. But why am I saying that? 
See, for instance, we have a Coast Guard officer who graduated from Sunny Maritime. We have a Greek captain who was sailing his ship into, say, New Orleans, and some incident occurred. While the Coast Guard comes to investigate the incident that occurred on board that Greek ship, they can look at each other. One might have a Sunny Academy, both have a Sunny Academy rates. And they say, did you go to Sunny Academy in New York? Yes, I did. Now, they're companions, <coughs> former students, they bond together they can try to assess what the incident occurred and try to find a resolution. But that's the partnership that we're building today between both countries, of the United States and, uh, and Greece. And I think that's a key role. So right now, that document is over in, uh, at the Academy, and both presidents, the former president and the current president, have visited Greece during Posidonia. And we're hoping that this summer, we finally have the final agreement signed between Greek merchant minister uh, for the police and uh, the president of Sunny Maritime, uh, President Anatolis. I think it's a great, another milestone, not only getting the, the uh, liberty ship over to Greece, but also having this new cooperation. Non -point connection and, uh, yes, yes. It brings, as you mentioned, repeated. Yep. And also, I just want to say in closing that uh, what's very important is that the liberty ship being over in uh, Piraeus right now. We thought it would be best to have the ship over by the uh, battleship Avero and the former U.S. Uh, destroyer, which is now the uh, former Greek destroyer, Velos, as a marine park. So that's probably another goal that this great idea. organization, that we have those three historic ships, Richard Marine, uh, the two warships, the Greek battleship Avero, and a former U.S. destroyer, all together as a uh, maritime museum. And I think that's our, our third goal. But, uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Adelina, for, for those remarks. Thank you. Uh, you, you. You mentioned repeatedly the key word, I think, bridge. Shipping builds bridges amongst cultures, and it's a global industry. And there, you want to take that as a, <clears throat> as a starting point and talk to us a little bit about the global nature of shipping. And you've been working in shipping for all your life, I understand. You are the best person to give us a sense of, of that aspect of shipping and how it brings people yeah. and uh, culture together. Thank you for the kind invitation. I don't know about the best person, but uh, you mentioned that uh, builds bridges. And maybe we should refer to some ideas that are unique in shipping. Um, the Jefferson idea, for example, uh, when uh, the transportation of goods was happening in small old boats. It was always overloaded. And whenever they had hard times, the only way to become uh, seaworthy again was to jettison some of the cargo. And it's quite interesting that that group devised a system and they said if we drop and we throw overboard some of the goods, when we get safely to the next port, we share the loss and all the saved parties, including the vessel, uh, share the loss and that was the Jetson idea. It's uh, a unique group of people that can come up with good ideas with a lot of trust. You can negotiate millions of dollars over the phone and you always hold to it. But let's go to your question of what is the global industry that we are talking about. Starting with the negatives, shipping is uh, a service that is provided in a very difficult environment. You need a lot of money to get into shipping. Some people feel that the field is overregulated. It's extremely competitive, brutal competition. It's cyclical, it fluctuates, and the volatility is huge. And a lot of money has been lost. All these negatives. So what are we talking about? In the same environment, there are all big opportunities. And other than technology, there is no other industry that made big fortunes. So a lot of money has been made in the shipping world. And a lot of service has been provided because, as one ship owner in Louisiana said, the goods, he said, guts, the gut must have been a ship owner. He put the goods away from where they needed so that there would be a need for the shipping service. So 
that's the reason we provide the service and a lot of great fortunes were made there. Um, in the simple world, we have different types of vessels, depending on the elements that they carry. We have the wet, which can be crude product carriers, and some liquefied stuff, chemical, asphalt. Then we have the gas, the LNGs, that carry liquefied natural gas and LPGs. And we have the dry bulk, which is carrying bulk cargoes, carrying containers, carrying cars, even animals, and our favorite one is the cruise that carries people. So that's the overall shipping activity. Thank you, thank you very much, Andrea. I'm one of those who believe that a ship is a living organism because it decide, the captain decides where it goes. It has full authority on, uh, on the affairs of the ship, but ships are subject to certain rules. You cannot put anything that floats and call it a ship. And when I think about classification societies, I think DMV. The, 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 the companies, the, the, the organizations that certify that whatever we build are seaworthy. And we have the Kirsi that uh, represents or comes from that area. We, we share the same background, we're both naval architects. Kirsi, do you give us the, your perspective on what the role of classification societies play in shipping and how they make the, the whole transportation of goods more efficient and safer? Thank you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so before I answer the question, I, I, I'd like to say that, um, well, I'm with the uh, ABS, American Bureau of Shipping, and the history of ABS and Greek shipping goes back to the Liberty ships. And um, ever since, um, Greek ship owners have been the biggest client base for ABS. So we have a very strong relationship with ABS. I also know the Liberty Ship in Piraeus quite well. We've been involved in the um, renovation, well, the transportation of it from, from the US to Piraeus, and then the renovation, um, working with Mr. Polemis. And um, um, we hold se seminars there, and we try to support um, the concern there. So that's a little bit of background on ABS and Greek shipping. Classification system has been in existence for over 150 years, and it is a very unique system for any industry. And it basically provides a self-regulation for the industry. The industry, shipping industry is regulated from outside as well, and more so these days. Um, but the classification societies are part of the industry, they are a, uh, a um, organizations who are involved in, with the ships from the design, approving the design, uh, to the construction of the ship. We survey that the ships are built to the approved drawings. And then during the service, we have periodic surveys to make sure that the vessel is still, is still in compliance with the requirements. We are unique in the sense that we have our own rules and regulations. You cannot be a classification society unless you have your own rules and regulations, which means that we have to invest a lot in technology, in rule development, and so we also provide a service as technical advisors to the industry. Um, so that, in short, we also do serve as recognized organizations for, for flag states, which means that we work um, on statutory regulations um, representing um, many uh, flag states who authorize us to, be, to, to work on their behalf. So that's in a nutshell what the classification system does, but, but the bottom line is our mission, all of us, all the classification organizations, the mission is safety and environmental protection and everything we do should fall under that umbrella. Thank you, thank you very much, Christian. Constantine, I know that you like history a lot. There are highlights from the, the, the Greek shipping history you care to share with us? Or? Well, I think uh, it goes both from merchant marine and also you know, closely tied to the Hellenic fleets of every time and going back to the uh, Battle of Salamis and Themistocles, that was a battle actually that 
defined uh, what Europe is today. You know, if the Persians had won, it would have been a much different uh, terrain today. So, and that was a, a battle of strategy and ability. And we said that before. You know, they they got what they needs to be done and actually won a much uh, larger enemy. And of course, there was you know during the Byzantine time we talked about the colonization of the Mediterranean Sea. You know, uh, talked about Marseille. Luke has spoken you know Alexandria. Uh, you know, uh, even in Barcelona at the time was a Greek colony. It was a very much smaller place than it is today. And uh, of course, you know, we talk about uh, Magna Grecia and Sicily, which was a, a big part, of, extended part of Greece at the time. Uh, during World War One, also Greek shipping played a big role in, in transportation. There are family names uh, that are still around today, that they were around at that time. And uh, we go to uh, further down World War Two and. The Liberty ships, uh, to put it in context, they restarted global commerce after World War II. There, they were the backbone of everything that was transported, and that's where, uh, where we are today. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting, actually, when I was talking to Mr. Polemis and Mr. Kostanov, which actually they are uh, great, have deep knowledge of all this information, of uh, uh, how important it was that these people actually worked on the ships. They put their sons to work on the ship. Because the only way to actually understand something, Mr. Polemis told me, is if you actually work on the ship and understand how it, you know, all of the different aspects. And I think that's actually uh, what uh, made the difference. Uh, Greece is in the crossroads of many civilizations. And, uh, People think because there is uh, enough water a coastline around us uh, makes us good swimmers. That's not the case. <laughs> uh, the Greeks into water, how do they may not come out? But uh, so this is not the reason of success. You know, it might sound obvious, but it's not. It's actually the entrepreneurial part, and this is something we like to uh, emphasize. If, if we can, because Greek shipping is the only independent shipping, uh, the largest independent body of shipping. You know, the other countries that have a large, large fleet, like China and Japan, for example, they are controlled by the government uh, or by the companies that, to carry the cargoes to, and cover the needs of the country. But the, uh, Greek shipping is actually the largest independent, and it has. Uh, uh, the owners have created all this wealth without the support of the country, because Greece itself wouldn't need more than a hundred ships to cover its needs, so to speak, M maybe less. I think the number that was told was 80, and you know, have like over 5,000. So it's, it's a global shipping, and it's also, that makes it one of the largest strategic assets that uh, both uh, the United States and NATO have, because as we very well known, and it was proven during the, you know, all the wars, and lately during the Iraq war, you cannot have a war with us and the logistics and the Greek shipping actually supplies a lot of the logistics that are happening right now. So it's, it's, it's an important uh, component and it's not just Greek, you know, it's much more, it's larger in context. I think your, your comments give us a perfect segue to, for me to ask for Andreas how, whether the shipping company has changed over the years. I mean, it used to be, as I think Constantine has said, captains who worked on the ships and became ship owners. You hear a company that traces back its history, you work for a company that traces back its history for quite some time. How do you see that mod evolution of the ship, of the ship company model? Sure. If I take a minute on what uh, Constantine said about the Greece, because the Greek shipping and the Greek navy that the Athenians developed Specifically, in 483 BC, the Athenians discovered a vein of silver in Labrium. That was a lot of silver and a lot of wealth was coming out of it, so it was a question of what to do with that wealth. So they decided to mine it, and the argument was, should we divide it as we do today to the citizens and distribute to the citizens, 
or do something more productive for the whole. Similar to what we do today of talking about taxes. Aristides said, let's divide it and each citizen gets their share. Themistocles had an opposite view and he said, instead of doing that, let's keep the money and go and build a navy. There was history with the Persians and what the other cities in Greece did. So he wanted a navy. And that was when they used the ostracism. And the result was that Aristides lost, and he was sent to exile, and Mr. Chris won, and he built 200 ships. Those 200 ships, three years later, were used when Xerxes came on, and the Salamis uh, naval fight uh, uh, pushed them away, and that's why we don't talk, speak uh, Farsi in Greece today. Now, about the evolution of shipping. Um, over the years, the ships became bigger and they used different mechanisms for energy. Originally, it was just the row and the sails, and eventually it became the steam engine and the diesel engine. And now we are talking about newer technologies that we use uh, less polluting uh, energy like uh, LNG. That was the evolution. In that, they were able to become safer thanks to some regulations, thanks to technology, but uh, there was never a very drastic step. It was gradual evolution. I see the vessels that were around in 1980 and the ones that were built up to five years ago, they were very similar, just <coughs> Now you have the ecotype vessels and the less fuel consuming vessels and eventually we may go to LNG. In uh, automation, we have big progress and now we even talk about autonomous vessels. So the industry is changing with bigger vessels, uh, more technologically advanced, safer vessels. You don't have, I remember when I was growing up in Greece every day in the radio, such and such vessel is missing, so many crew members, we haven't heard from them for days. Those things you don't have anymore. It's a much safer environment. Still tough for the seamen, but uh, way, way much safer. In terms of a shipping company, how the shipping company model is changing, if at all? It used to be a single ship. The captain used to own a ship. Now, how many ships sometimes are on the road? Yeah. Particularly in the last few years, there is a tendency for consolidation. Just at the beginning of the century in Greece, you had uh, about 1,700 Greek ship owners. Now you have about 800. Uh, the number of vessels grew, but the number of ship owners has shrunk. Uh, the, there is a big tendency for merging, for consolidation, uh, the operating mechanism has changed. Before, every ship owner had to have his own teams from technical to crewing to everything. Now there are managers that undertake those, those duties and assignments, and the ship owner can be a private company or it can be a public company easily. We have been in the beginning of the century, we had a lot of activity in new companies in IPOs. Or lately we have funds that they simply go buy vessels, they give them to a manager to do the commercial, another manager to do the technical. It's a new environment that uh, makes getting in and out in uh, the shipping activity easier and you have new players like the funds. The funds play a major role today and it's expected that they will play a more significant role in the future. But the, the technical and operational requirements to manage a ship have gone up. And it's more complicated ships, more regulation. Uh, companies have to spend, invest resources in being able to observe and comply with all of this. I want to go back to Kirsi and ask, in the context of the environment, of pollution, is shipping a good citizen? Or is it doing, is it over polluting? Is it under polluting? Is it, uh, tends to have sometimes a bad name associated with it, which tell us whether that's true or not. If we consider, for example, um, CO2 emissions, which is a, a 
hot topic these days. Um, um, shipping is the most efficient mode of transportation. Um, per ton mile, the emissions um, per ton mile are the least from shipping if you compare it with any other type of mode of transportation. Uh, mode of transportation. So it, it, it is um, essential for the global economy, for the wealth of the world, and its um, emissions are much less than any if, if we transport it in, in, in different ways. Now, we have to keep in mind, though, is shipping is a big industry. So if you, if you turn, talk in terms of total emission numbers, shipping is like the fourth largest nation in the world mm -hmm. in CO2 emissions. So this is where the, the regulatory uh, world focuses on. And therefore, there is a need for continuous improvement um, in the performance. Um, if you look at the sort of environmental performance of shipping, um, with the environmental focus evolving in the world, shipping has evolved as well. So if you think in terms of um, 70s and 70s, 80s and 90s, the focus was on oil pollution. And a number of various regulations were introduced from loading on top to segregated ballast tanks to double hull tankers that have had a, an effect of incredible reduction in oil pollution. So right now, the oil pollution from, from ships is very, very small. Um, the, the focus has shifted to emissions, to ballast water um, from one area of the world to another, and the different organisms that ballast water can transport to air emissions. And these are the areas that the industry is right now struggling, um, not that they do not want to comply, but the regulations are very complex. The technology is not mature. Uh, the implement, implementation of the, of the regulations is not always clear. So we all are struggling um, to comply and... Um, Define the right level of regulation. <laughs> well, the, the, the question is more, um, if you regulate something, please give us the technology that actually we can use to comply. <coughs> From your position, you can see how various owners comply with regulations or uh, deal with all this uh, regulatory environment. Are, can you say whether Greek owners are any different or are just like everybody else? Or can you characterize them? Do you have any reason to characterize them differently? Or so Greek, good or bad? Greek owners own such a large percentage <laughs> of the world's fleet that they kind of um, define, define the norm. Define the norm. And obviously you have a spectrum, but in general I'd say that the Greek uh, shipping is very environmentally conscious. I think um, it's obvious that the Greek ship owners love the sea. You know, most of them come from the islands themselves, and they love the sea, and they want to keep the sea clean. And one of the demonstrations of that is Helmepa, that was yes. established, uh, founded by George Milibanos a yeah. long time ago. And it's a very, very active organization in, in and similar ones have been created in every, and we have here in Namepa, North America. Correct. Correct. Can I just add? Yeah, of course. I, I wanted to ask you. Sure. sure. I, I think another key role is how government plays the role in shipping. Now, we had the uh, Paris uh, uh, Climate uh, Agreement, and yet you have a president today that uh, wants to uh, not abide by the rules of the Paris uh, Climate uh, Agreement. But I say it because the new, new issue right now with shipping is probably the pollution from emissions, from the oils that are burned, from the, from the bunkers. We know that bunkering has dropped uh, on average from $600 a ton down to $280 a ton, which should help the economy of the Greek ship owners. And that's the question to be asked. Since the price has dropped, why isn't it resonating to the Greek ship owner as far as cost? But then it's when government gets involved the regulations are very stringent, and do you loosen up some of those stringent regulations as far as the emissions? Do you add fuel additives? 
Right. What, what is the answer? And I think that's something for the future where how do you balance that out where you can have a ship operator operate a ship, a clean ship, but also work with government on the rules and regulations of the emissions. And that's achieving the state exactly. of That's why you see a lot yeah. of the LNG conversions to LNG. Right. And in the context of these concerns and uh, what what do you think, Leonida, is the, the how, I mean, you're, you're an American politician amongst many other things, I would imagine. How do you think your constituents, yourself, look at shipping, or great shipping, or shipping in general? Do you care, people care here? Is it a small, in Greece is a big part of life, or GDP, or activity. Here in the States, it's a very small one. But do people here care? Well, I think, that I know these gentlemen right here do care because they are uh, at the uh, Kings Point uh, Navy Academy. But I think the population as a whole, shipping really wasn't something that uh, was a leading industry in the United States. I mean, we've seen over the years uh, the expenses of a lot of American companies, the crewing, the cost, the uh, labor laws, and you've seen that the U.S. has not been a very large uh, ship leader. So I think you don't see a lot of individuals, whether of my constituents who do go out and serve in the U.S. merchant uh, maritime industry and i think that's why you don't hear a lot but in greece it's every other household whether you're well, in, greece, in norway and country. exactly uh, and that i think plays a key role where here in the united states we what we see as shipping is how the, the new uh nissan or the new toyota gets or the new kia comes over from south korea how, how it ships here and you see a lot of these ships coming into these ports and unloading a thousand uh vehicles i mean that's probably given sort of a smaller view. But also, I mean, so, you know, we had the hurricane in the Caribbean uh, this summer, and Puerto Rico is still like that. It has problems, and uh, they had to repeal the Jones Act for a few days, because they couldn't get the stuff there. And, you know, the, what's the hurricane over here in New York, uh, the name of it? Uh, uh, Sandy. And we couldn't get gas. Not because there was no gas, but because there were no tankers to bring it from the Gulf and here. So it, it, you might say we don't care, but it actually affects our everyday lives in, in a major way. So it's kind of, a, yeah. uh, we do care when we did one word in mind when by we, the other man. <laughs> and that's exactly what uh, the initiative that Louis is targeting, I mean, making, communicating the, the critical role shift in place even without knowing it in our, in our everyday lives. And uh, uh, without that, we wouldn't be able to have the type of lives that, that we have. But you mentioned about the cost. And I think that's a good point to talk a little bit about cost and uh, the profitability of the industry, how to make money in shipping. Yeah. For one thing, shipping is, is known, is, uh, you can easily observe, it's a very cyclical industry. You mentioned, I think, and there fortunes are made in shipping uh, Shipping and technology, it was your question, someone mentioned that shipping and technology were the, the areas that uh, made fortunes, but also fortunes were lost in shipping because it's cyclical. Tell us a little bit about cyclicality in shipping. What drives it? How you should think about it if you want to invest or either in stocks or in... Uh... You can probably give the best example because the gentleman here, his group, bought a vessel for a little less a little over eight million dollars. And a few, about a year and a half later, sold it for in the high for teams, I think. Yeah, so, so one, a good project we did among some other who are not as good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how things happen. You buy, uh, the Greeks have been very good at that. In uh, their timing has been excellent. And many people are following what they are doing. And they are good in what they call S&P, sales and purchase. As I mentioned, to buy a vessel for 8.2 million and sell it 15 months later for 14.7, that's nothing to sniff about. Um, that's the best thing that the Greeks are doing, buying and selling vessels. There are instances where they sold vessels to Norwegians for very high money, Years later, they, not very many years later, they bought the vessels for one third of the price and then they sold them again to another group. Even in the Liberty vessels, 
although the Greeks uh, were awarded uh, 98 vessels of uh, almost a thousand that they were given to different nationalities, they got involved, and again, there were 1,000 vessels available. They got involved during the years in 600 of them in the buying and selling activity. So 600 out of the 1,000 vessels were handled at one time and controlled by the Greeks. So buying and selling. The other activity is to charter the vessels out. That used to be easier and more traditional for the tankers. All the Greek seaporters that we know, like Onassis, Miatis, and so on, they built tankers for big oil companies, the Seven Sisters at the time, and they chartered them for 20 years, a nice steady income that existed. So in tankers in particular, they made good money by chartering the vessels out. Uh, in dry bulk, there are not good examples like that, but in dry bulk, most of the money has been made in, in purchase and sale. Shipping is providing a very cheap service. Even today, you can ship from the US to Japan uh, one metric ton of grain for $45 a day, which is better than 20 that was a year ago. But $45 is very cheap for a very heavy parcel of one ton. Of course, it has to be involved, but it's, it's a really cheap uh, way of transport. And it's a facilitator of the trade. You have traders, like the grain that I mentioned. Uh, they make a trade, and they say, we'll ship 50,000 tons of wheat from US to China, and they walk away, and an operator with a ship comes along, and whenever the agreement is next March, will present the vessel and transport the cargo safely to the destination. A big facilitator in the trade. Thank you. And Constantine, <coughs> there is a lot of reasons for specificity, right? But one can easily point out to one to the overall during when times are good. And uh, when the ships get delivered, it's supposed to take some, a couple of years to build the ship. Typically, the, the circumstances, the economic circumstances have changed, and that creates. Tell us about your experience or your views or the new building aspect and the Greeks and others ordering in Japan, Korea, but, whatever. Uh, I remember what a friend of mine, uh, Petros, told me. Uh, he's a publisher of a newspaper in Greece. And uh, there is actually a, a camaraderie among ship owners. You know, the times are good, people order more. Uh, but somehow, as Andrea said, in this whole context, uh, in the sale and purchase, uh, they have figured out how to how to make the money. So the cyclicality, you know, basically, when you have more supply, the prices are down. You are a CFO of the company, so you deal with the num these numbers uh, daily. And uh, we had that uh, issue here, you know, for uh, this year. Uh, it went up, and when they say it went up, we actually it, it doubled. So uh, because the supply of ships uh, dwindled, there was a lot of them went to scrapping, and Andreas actually was better because he is uh, ordering the new buildings. And Deciding on what is to be scrapped, and um, and of course uh, the level of trade. You know, global trade has been increasing, and that's a great thing. You know, China is uh, a major factor in this. It imports when it comes to dry bulk, especially a great uh, percentage. In Africa, for example, where the population is growing, with, uh, and we have uh, challenges uh, with the ports because the ports uh, are not uh, made uh, for the big ships, you know, because the different uh, dimension, you know, when it comes to uh, the different sizes of ships. So this is a lot of uh, factors that actually uh, determine uh, the price and the cyclicality. And, and right now, it, it's a good time for dry bulk. Tangers are not doing so well. Um, there is a and it's also like everything else when it is in Wall Street. I think today or yesterday it hit 24,000. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot of feeling that goes into it, you know. And, uh, 
and the, and the Greek ship owners look at each other and say, okay, this guy has 68 ships and uh, I went down from last week, you know, from last month to 65, so I have to buy three more, so I go up on the, on the category, you know, so I'm like number three instead of number five. So there's this camaraderie, there is also this uh, cyclicality that's evident in all the world economies. And, um, and right now there's also you know, the, the feelings that people have about this. Because it's, uh, it's not only technical, it's from my, my understanding. Well, very important to the Greek industry, to the ship owners, the uh, whole Eric lines, the Greek line. Uh, many of you remember uh, Queen Federica, which was an American ship, the Batson line, which got bought by uh, Andres, and uh, that also helped the Greek shipping industry to the Greek ship owners to profit. Uh, today, one of the biggest uh, cruise ship lines uh, had the origins from Greece. Andres became celebrity cruise lines, if I am I correct, which if you see in the brochure, you've got about probably 10 of the biggest cruise ships in the world with that ex celebrity, and most of those ships have Greek captains and other cruise ship companies have Greek captains and Greek engineers that serve in today's cruise industry. So that also has another key component of Greek shipping that we should not forget that many years ago, right out here in New York Harbor, we had many Greek ships that came and sailed from ports along with the SS United States, France, uh, the Italian cruise lines, and, and this area right here in the 19. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s was uh, was, was a traffic ship of, uh, of passenger ships and then the cruise ships, but it did play a key role. That was a, a very important component in Greek shipping, the passenger and also going to cruise ships. And today, it's the ferry boats. It's people crossing the bridge that we talked there. Exactly. Let's not forget also the ferry boat passenger business in Greece and between yeah. Italy and Greece too. Yeah. And also, you know. You we go to Greece and all that, we go up and down. The, the east of the west coast, we see a lot of yachts, and uh, there was actually an, an Liberty ship during uh, an event uh, about three weeks ago, and with American ambassadors that uh, actually, uh, not announced, but uh, it was a, a Greek American company that uh, bought the shipyard in Syria, the island of Syria, in the Orion, and uh, Onyx, and they're going to actually convert it to, uh, to build the yachts and to refurbish the action. So this is actually, some things are happening in, you know, this one of the American investment that came from here to there. When I think about shipping, I think about two things primarily, two big things very important. One is the human capital, the people that are involved in shipping, and the other, of course, the ships themselves. And while good people you can educate and create, good ships you have to build. And unless we build it right from the beginning, it's hard for the asset to become right later on. So I want to ask Kirsi, how much you are involved when, during the construction of the ship? How you, you are involved in every aspect of the construction as a supervisor of, um, authority, or not authority, consultant? Tell us a little bit about that and how that could actually make the ship make more money if you have a a better construction, a more solid uh, vessel build? Well, so our role is, first of all, in establishing the rules uh, for, the, for the vessel construction, for the design and construction. And then we have surveyors um, at the shipyard 24-7. And um, they uh, have certain things that uh, they are they have to survey based on our rules to make sure that the ship is built as it's originally been approved to be built. But then we also patrol um, the shipyard to make sure that um, things are done the way they're supposed to be done. Um, so we basically uh, kind of monitor the the uh, operation in the shipyard. So we are a an independent. Um, third party um, where we um, are between the shipyard and the, um, the owner who have the contract in place and we make sure that everything is done as, um, as, as required. Um, so we are very much involved. 
Uh, in terms of the how much you know how much we can influence whether you make money uh, or not on the ship, one of the aspects that we've been doing um, a lot of work recently, or in the last few years, is um, different aspects of energy efficiency. Um, so we can we can assist in um, assist owners and, and designers. Um, in um, making the vessels more fuel uh, fuel efficient. So there are a number of things that we can help with. We can also evaluate different technology for the environmental compliance so that the owners can make uh, more informed decisions when they select equipment. So there are a number of aspects that, that, that uh, we do. I think fuel efficiency and energy efficiency, Andrea, is probably one of the key commercial characteristics of a ship. I mean, uh, know from my experience that if the ship burns a little bit, a couple of tons more per day is less attractive to people to use it, right? Uh, yeah, it relates directly to the dollar spent. And every dollar saved is a dollar earned. That's quite right. mm -hmm. Let, Let's look to the future a bit. Uh, I think we're approaching the end. We have another eight, ten minutes, right? Um, what, what is coming? Andrea, anything coming in terms of new technology in New York? Uh, the office can have a good record of what's happening at any given time in the engine and all the other <coughs> instruments on board. And that's significant. I remember instances where the chief engineer didn't have good knowledge and he was wasting the loop oils. And that could be going on for a long time and that's a lot of money. Now, every day, the office knows how much loop oil was consumed and if it's off track, they can correct it immediately instead of taking months to get the, the papers and uh, review that. In the commercial area, there is now a lot of information, an instant information, and uh, many directions towards automation. In the channeling area, you can easily find out what's out out there in cargos and in vessels, and find ways to combine it. And now there are some programs that help you even trade some of the issues. Some big companies like uh, BHP, they implemented and automated the bidding system on the internet. They have owners that are, that are pre-approved, they have a cargo out, and there is an auction, and whoever gives the lowest price gets the cargo without uh, any human interference there. Still, the projects play a major role, but they have to be specific and offer a service because there is a lot of information out there and a lot of transparency. Well, that's, very, that's very interesting. To some extent exciting, to some, some other people might fear, might fear the technology progress, technological progress. Okay, Constantine, you are doing some trading as well, I understand, from alongside your yes. shipping dinner. How the connection of trading commodities with the shipping of them do you see it changing? Well, it's, uh, Andreas uh, alluded to that earlier. It's a matter of trust. When you uh, ask for a ship, uh, pretty much everything is done on the phone by, or by email. And it can be done in a matter of hours or minutes, you know, without, uh, you know, the, the contracts come later. And this is a unique industry in that respect, that uh, it's all, uh, you know, especially for mentioned some companies that, you know, you pick up the phone and you actually get the ship where you want, you know, within the prescribed time. Greek uh, charter uh, uh, people like Andreas were before, way before Uber, they were actually deciding where the ship, you know, where the ship will go and pick up the cargo and what's the best route to make uh, money on the trade. And, uh, of course, this is being uh, technology has advanced this greatly, but uh, uh, this is actually how it always worked. Let's start uh, closing our discussion, but let me ask a question and then give you a chance to answer it or say some other closing remark that you want. If you put your investor head, would you would you consider investing in shipping? Donita, you want to start since you've been you hear enough about well, shipping. So. Investment's a key, a key component. I mean, we have uh, a lot of international forms. We have the Capital Link uh, International Investment Shipping Forum, and I see Olga, of course, knows he's here with a brother who 
our leaders in putting together these forums, whether they're held here in New York or whether in, in Athens, Greece, and that's the decision where people make. Do I get involved in shipping? Is there a profit? But the issue here is getting Wall Street involved, getting bankers involved, getting investments involved to allow Greek ship owners to purchase more ships or new ships and discard the older vessels that cost a lot more money and have the newer technology vessels. But that's a good question because it's a balancing act. Whether the ship owner has the investment capabilities to buy new ships. But again, uh, today, like I said earlier, we've had bunkering drop from $600 a ton to $250 a ton. Should that have been right away energized the shipping industry? We, we, I, I don't think we've seen those results yet. And that's probably a component. You've got your fuel prices going down, less labor on board newer ships. It takes less, back in the old days, it was 43 crew members on average on a cargo ship. Today it's probably around 18 to 24 with the automation. So it's, uh, I would, I'm very skeptical right now. I would counteract to your comments about the uh, issue. Sure. You saw the, the rates that the ship owners were earning in the last few years, you, they dropped 90% in some cases uh, com compared to the peak of the, uh, just before the financial crisis. But, uh, do you see, do you, do you care to comment on that? Uh, either from what might be coming next or whether you would yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about what's coming next because investing in shipping is tricky for me because it would be a conflict of interest. So, <laughs> you don't want that. so let me talk about what's coming. So um, on the technology front, there are really three key, uh, key elements. There's increased automation. There is increased connectivity because of the satellite constellations that now provide a lot more connectivity between the ships and, and the shore. And then there is the, the big data, the capability of, first of all, to transfer the data and the data analytics that allows us to take the data, transfer it into a form that provides information that we can make decisions on. And this is changing our world on a daily basis. And the same will be taking place in shipping. And um, I'm on Saturday, I'm uh, flying to Shanghai uh, to a conference where the topic of my talk is uh, journey to autonomy, um, interim benefits from, from this. Um, and I, I believe that autonomy for shipping is way, way out there. However, the research that goes into autonomous ships will bring uh, benefits to traditional shipping much earlier than we have autonomous ships. So that's that's the future I see. Thank you. Gentlemen, anything to Yes, I would uh, keep investing in shipping. Uh, I'll be mindful that there will be no huge opportunities in the past, as in the past, because uh, it's more transparent and there is a lot of capacity out there. The yards are eager to get new orders. Only the Japanese and the Koreans have good slots filled until uh, 2019 and 2020. But the Chinese are very eager to get orders. So if there is a need for any type of vessel, they can produce a few hundred of them in a matter of one or two years. So that can kill that good market. But there will be opportunities. Timing is of great essence. Things are cyclical, they are low, they can be very, very discouraging, but there can be an opportunity. Today you have the tankers, you have the VLCC, but in order to build one today you need $90 million, and to make some money you need to be making more than 30000 a day earning only half of it, 15,000. So every day you are losing 15,000, which is a lot of money. Some people can see an opportunity in that if things change because the values are down. I don't have a good prediction for the future where you can invest money for the long term. In the short term, the dry bulk is very strong and I think the next year it will be a good year for the dry bulk industry. But after that, if the new building comes in and new vessels come in, it can kill that market as well. So, no long-term prediction, drive off for the next year. Constantine, 
we have the last word, but let me ask you to answer the question about shipping in Greece. Will shipping continue to be important for Greece, or will its role? Uh, as long as, uh, as long as we get it right, <laughs> things uh, uh, there is a big tradition and. Uh, there is a lot of young people uh, to be involved in the shipping. Uh, maybe the crisis helped. I think there is a lot of people that looked uh, again of uh, what uh, what makes money and what uh, what works. So they look into shipping because before it was looked upon as a very you know you have to go away if you are on the ship or it was very specialized. So there's uh, a lot of things. They will definitely play a big part. There are differing views. Uh, uh, the lead in being the largest independent uh, fleet in the world. So it will be a force to be reckoned with uh, in the next uh, many years, hopefully. And uh, will things change? Things always change. I just don't know which, you know, Greece has always been in shipping because the location alone, is, you know, is, at the time it was much more important than now, but it makes, uh, makes it a vital to the survival. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panel for a great, for a great discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, the moderator tonight, uh, Dr. Palacios Otasos, as he is. Um, his background is uh, very impressive, and I, I ask you to look at that background. We had a lot of fun uh, yesterday. Of course, most of them because I did have uh, Dr. Asidis and I did have uh, Constantine on the air. And we talked about a lot of these things. I think what's important about what, what happened today and what happened um, last year is that <clears throat> we're, communicating, we're communicating to uh, a broader audience because this is not an audience that's from the shipping industry. But we're communicating about an extremely, extremely important uh, industry that in particular in New York, we have to know a lot more about. And uh, I don't want to put you on a spot, Tasso, um, okay, about, about what some of the things that, uh, that you are trying to do. But I think, I think that shipping is extremely important, in particular also for New York. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, Hellenic shipping. We did talk historically uh, and uh, Quite frankly, even in the modern times, that a lot of the offices, a lot of the shipping offices, are actually uh, located in New York. But I think I think we have to bring um, Hellenic shipping into New York. In other words, a lot of the, the ship owners and a lot of the the thought process that goes in, uh, because some of the things that we were listening to, and I was I was fascinated by the discussion, is sort of like inside ball playing. And we have to know a little bit more about this industry. I think it's extremely important for the United States. It's extremely important, obviously, for the Hellenic Republic. And in particular, with what's happening internationally on a, on a geopolitical basis, that, and it relates to, to the monument, that we have to link up a little bit more closer. So I'd like to ask you just back one second to discuss something that you're doing on the side, what, what, which I think is going to be of interest to this particular audience? I think uh, New York is known for its uh, involvement in shipping. I mean, uh, we talked about the history of shipping in New York uh, during some, some members of the panel. But uh, what is known for now primarily is its capital. Shipping is an industry that tries, that's very, very competitive and shops, it's uh, what it needs at the most efficient place. We built our ships in China and Korea and Japan, which are the best uh, builders and cheaper builders. We uh, man our ships, I mean, less so, unfortunately, with Greek seamen and American seamen, but more so with uh, people from the Philippines and uh, other countries that have their developing a maritime uh, interest. We, we buy insurance in the London market. Uh, we have... Uh, executive expertise still we get a lot of it in Greece and in Europe. Capital we get in the United States. So New York has a solid place that is, is accepted as the, cap, the, the, the capital for shipping of the world, but at the same time there's a lot of other services that come with capital. Legal services, arbitration services, insurance services. 
So there is a, the people who are involved in shipping in New York are trying to promote New York uh, as a maritime center, vis-a-vis -vis London or Singapore or Hong Kong. And there is a, a group of people here that uh, uh, try to do that. And perhaps there are some commonalities uh, with what we try to do with the monument with them. Well, that's why I brought it up, okay? because, because obviously there's a lot of capital involved here. Obviously, it's an important it's an important thing, and certainly and certainly I look at all different angles, quite frankly, to support the concept when you're talking about building a monument. So, to the extent that this particular industry uh, gets more involved in New York, it starts to bring back some of the aspects of New York that existed and create some of the things that you talked about in terms of uh, of different cities and how they're acknowledged in terms of the, of the shipping of the shipping industry. In terms of the uh, in terms of the future, I think I think the Hellenic uh, shipping industry has spoken this year. I believe that in the new orders, if I'm not mistaken, they ordered about 58 ships or 60 ships uh, in the first six months of, of, uh, of uh, 2017. And that tells a story again. Uh, in terms of the age of the fleet, I think the Hellenic fleet is actually, is actually be modernizing and becoming younger than a lot of the fleets that are out there. But from a, from a strategic point of view, and I think this is where, where the shipping industry has to come into New York and come into America a little bit more to help out the US, but there are other people that are looking at different things. For example, we didn't talk tonight, and we're not gonna talk about tonight because we've talked about a lot of things, but you know, the Silk Road, okay? The new Silk Road, what's taking place in transportation in terms of, of that particular scenario. In terms of the ports and who owns the port facilities and things like that. These are just things that we're gonna talk about in the future, but. I'm going to end the discussion by saying this. We are creating, we have, we have announced that we are creating this um, committee that we talked about to start uh, putting together a lot of different things, both the, uh, the soft aspects, which we talked about in terms of the arts, uh, and uh, the politics, okay, of, of bringing to the forefront the linkage between the United States and uh, the Hellenic Republic the importance of the merchant marines, the importance of the creation of the modern fleet, and something that I think will be to the benefit of both nations. Please, a round of applause for our, our panel tonight. I hope you enjoy the program, and thank you for being uh, here tonight.